Hello, welcome to TGIS 311 Maps and GIS Day 4, and this is for 2024. As a quick heads up for classroom, what we'll be doing in class for day four, I'm going to do some quick demos, particularly items that came up in week three or will come up in week three, such as the background, transparency, turning off portions of the legend, what are the red dots in your legend, and in the text boxes, be sure to have no spaces in folders and locked versus unlocked layers. This week, you're going to be refreshing skills learned in Lab X and Lab 1, and Lab 2 begins today. You will be using data from the 2008 and 2012 election to create a representation of the data. And you'll be comparing Democrat and Republican votes. Some goals for week four lecture. I wanted to emphasize that one of the only issues seems to be from LabX is the SNPs that you'll be placing or have been submitting. Once we start inserting SNPs and images into your our cartography, it's important to make them very precise. And you can do that either in the snipping process or in an editor such as, um, I think it's called Paint in Microsoft, that uh, is a free application. There's also some things, I believe Canva, which is a web application that may be helpful as well. As you're completing your cartography, there are multiple options that you can choose. Lab one had a basic layout described or prescribed for you, but in future labs, you're welcome to use your creativity to create a, a cartography masterpiece that's all your own. Remember last week I mentioned that we cannot lose our minds. You can do this. You're going to be starting with some analysis this week that you haven't done yet. And it might seem a little bit complicated at first, but you'll get it. You just follow the directions carefully and you'll be able to proceed through the lab. There are some file differences that I'm going to show you in an upcoming slide. Be sure to accept the learning plan assignments and <clears throat> That will allow them to be in your learning plan so you can easily take that screenshot of you completing the plan. Remember that you don't need to earn 100% on the quizzes after each learning plan item. You can repeat them and complete the quiz to obtain the required 80% score, I believe it is. There's going to be an Excel refresher in lab two. You're using real data, and this is data that's provided. It definitely does work, and all of the directions guide you towards the ultimate data that you're going to need. You're going to import some Excel data into Arc Pro and then join it with some shapes, and that process will be described to you completely in the lab directions and in some of the demos that I will be presenting during class. There's two types of data joining. There's spatial and non-spatial. The, the method that you'll be using in lab two is the non-spatial version. It's, a, it's called an attribute join because you're using common attributes within the data. To join them. You'll have the same attribute in the shape as well as in the table that you're going to be joining. And those are the attribute tables. There is a spatial join that you'll learn how to use in upcoming labs. The easiest way to remember how to join data is to always start with the shape. 
So we start with the feature class or the shapefile and then add the non-spatial components using a right click and join. In addition to that, skipping over to the right side, under Lab 2 Demos, the join is the layer only. It doesn't affect the actual data. So the process includes at the very end of the join to export the data which completes the join. It physically attaches the data to the shape. So the table data is attached to the shape data so it's one and the same. And you'll give that a new name so that you have the data available to use in other projects or in another data frame, uh, or another map, I should say. Every pro project, there's a list of, and, of procedures that must be accomplished prior to, and you'll do those again in Lab 1, or excuse me, Lab 2. You've done them in Lab X and in Lab 1. The best way to proceed through that is either using the LabX directions or the document transitioning to Arc Pro, which contain all the steps you need to complete the process in preparation for Lab 2. Just for your reference, Lab X and Lab 1, I believe the scale was about 1 to 150,000, and you were guided on choosing symbology for clarity be sure to do so in all future labs. I wanted to make a quick note about the WGISA conference. I've been talking about it quite a bit. I'm going to mention it again, perhaps in class, but I wanted to mention it here. The dates are the 11th through the 13th. You can go to the WGISA website listed here, wgisa.org, to find out more about it. Last year, there were 20 free registrations for students. I highly encourage you to attend the conference. Even if you do have to pay, you can obtain the money from UW, and there's plenty of people in our class that probably can guide you to that, or if necessary, I'll have somebody come in and explain that process to you. But you get, you obtain the funding right from the university. You pay into a fund and you can utilize those funds to attend conferences. And this is an exceptional conference to attend. And there are no classes being held during that time because it's our summer break. It's June 11th through the 13th. There's some great presentations that you'll be able to see. You're gonna be able to network. And it's not all about learning the technology. It's also about the social events, meeting new people, going to a couple different locations and being introduced to people that may actually be hiring you in the future. There is a Dictomics Award that I highly encourage you to attend that session. It'll be filled with students from around the state, particularly those from UWT and perhaps UW Seattle that have completed a project in their certificate or their program and they're vying for the Dick Thomas Award, which is monetary prizes involved. If you complete the GIS certificate, that is something you'll definitely be qualified to do, and I'll be encouraging you to submit your final project to the conference next year. This slide contains some data types that you've used in the past. You know now that GIS data, it, vector data, consists of points, lines, and polygons, and you've used shapefiles. Those are in the bottom, and those are the greenish colored files. There are also a different type of file that you'll be using in Lab 2, and they work very similarly. They're called feature classes, and those are gray. So we call them features or feature classes, in these examples, the feature classes are stored within a feature data set and then a geo database and then a folder. In lab two, you'll just be using the feature classes within a feature data set, not within the, or excuse me, the geo database, not the feature data set. So you will not have a feature data set. 
that will pop up in later labs. For right now, you're just utilizing the geodatabase, which is the .gdb. Coverages are not used hardly anywhere at the moment. They're the oldest technology on this slide. They are vector data, and if you look to the right side of the slide, they are yellow, and they contain multiple components. And this may re bring you back to the Windows version of shapefiles. Shapefiles have multiple components in Windows, similarly to how the coverages have multiple items in Arc Pro or Arc Map. Now it is a lot simpler to view using the shape files at the very bottom and also the features or feature classes. We don't tend to see any more coverages, but I thought I'd include them include them in case you happen to see them. Here is another view of three shape files, points, polygons, and lines in this order that also show up as multiple objects within Windows. In addition, I've shown the data path. In this case, it's this PC, then F, and several folders to where the shapefile data exists. There's the shapefile data. If you click on this path in Windows, you'll get the actual string. So F colon slash AAA teaching underscore GIS is the same thing as what you see above, although it's just listed in a data path format. Some people find one easier to read, other people like the standard format with, uh, instead of these little arrows, you have slashes and you can see the actual path. Finding the actual path to the data is important so that's why I'm showing you the actual path and you can pull that up by just clicking in this path within Windows and that path is right here. You notice that in the left side of this Windows I have a geodatabase folder and a coverage folder to hold the data. In this case I am clicked on the shapefile data which is shown here with the multiple components and then over in Arc Pro on the right. Or it could also be Arc Catalog and Arc Map. Moving on to some legends, there's, these are just some examples of poor versus good and great legends. The legend in the top left where the mouse is, you want to avoid this type of legend where there are still underscores. We need to remove the underscores in our legend. The one beneath it is a lot better. It has um, no underscores, capitalization. The names are changed a little bit to our, so that they're more easily readable. The next legend is okay in that it has the percentages properly listed. I'll show you a different one that does not, but there are still underscores in the legend. And then this is the field name that's also being shown that isn't necessary in this legend. So to fix this legend, the this would need to be changed, the title, and then this line can actually be removed. This portion down here is very well done. It has taken the decimals and turned it into a percentage. So that's a good work on that item. This legend is very good. There are no errors in it. The middle one where the mouse is. The next is one that needs to have some work done. There are some underscores in both the shape files or features there's underscores in the title, percent pov should not be there. That could perhaps say percent poverty. And then these decimals, which equal, if you inverse it, equal this legend over here, they're the right numbers, but it's not an easily readable format. These should be changed into percentages. And as this one shows, this legend shows it's starting from 0% and moving 
are increasing as you go towards the bottom. That's probably the best way to look at this percent poverty data. Moving up, an exceptional legend from, it looks like lab one, very easily, very easy to read. There are all capitals, but that was a design choice by the author of the map, and I would not take off points for that. That's your choice. And then another nice legend with a little bit of a gray background, which also helps the aesthetics of the particular map that it was on. And lastly, just moving back to the first legend, be careful and cautious about using a, an odd colored background for your legend. With this minty green background, it and perhaps not in the actual map, these colors or color swatches are going to look different with a green background than they are on a white or gray background. In class, you will get a few demos on data properties, your shapefile properties in this case. You are welcome to open up Lab 2 data to see this live on your computer. I know it's very small on the screen. Or if you've saved the PowerPoint slide deck, you can zoom into it or make it larger on your screen so you can see these items as I point them out in class. These properties give the user plenty of information about the data so they can make the proper decisions about how to use the data. Demos live in the classroom will include differences in projected and not projected, the data type, shapefile path, the geometry type, type Z and M values, the spatial reference, prime meridian, datum, and spheroid. And those are, most of those are in the white boxes. While we won't discuss every concept in detail, we'll touch on them now and expand our deep dive later in the quarter as they become more relevant. In class, these live demos for this type of data will uh, talk about selected counties, turning layers on and off and minimizing them, the table and the geography, the um, clearing selection, concatenation, joining the layer. Remember, it's not the data, it's in the layer. Drawing order, data source, do's and don'ts, the geodatabase, and starting a an attribute join. Remember, there's an attribute join and there's a, a spatial join. We're only doing the attribute join in lab two. Features and attributes. At this point, there are some features, point features, vector data, visible in the features map. Some are highlighted in aqua, some are not. The ones highlighted in aqua, these four, are also highlighted in the attribute table. So they were either highlighted by hand in the map or in the table. I could click 696 or 686 and drag down to 689 to highlight all of them. Either way is acceptable. In this case, these four are highlighted in the table and the map. We could export at this point from the layer in the contents, right click, export a new, the data, and we would get just four items in that data. There would be four points, just these four points. And that is a common practice to break down our data to the, the actual items that we're looking for. If there's time in class, I will demonstrate this activity or this procedure as it's a very, very common in Art Pro. On the right, you can notice that the coverages are not supported in Art Pro. They're just a bunch of emptiness. Uh, coverages are not used in Art Pro. We can, however, see the shape files in the shape file folder and the feature classes in the geodatabase data. 
Again, you are not using a feature data set in this lab, but you will in future labs. For right now, you can think of the geodatabase as another item that's similar to a folder, but not exactly like a folder, but it does store feature classes. This is another quick example of highlighting data in the table and also in the map. In this case, it looks as though there's two items selected, but there are three. Notice it says three of 49 selected. It takes a little bit of investigation to see that there is another item over here that is selected. And the reason for that is these are one of, these are all part of well, these two are part of the same county. It's a multi-part feature and it has two lines within the attribute table. And then this over here is the third one. So if we were to export this by right clicking and data export data, we would have three items as a shape and then just three items in our attribute table. And that is one of the, again, key features of Arc Pro being able to select and export to make smaller bits of our data. This slide was inadvertently left off of the PDF. I may include it at a later date, but for right now you won't be able to find it. I think it is excluded. We have another situation or uh, example of highlighting this being line data, and these are feature classes. They come from this area down here. Thus, they are feature class layers, so to speak. They were derived from a feature class. And in this case, there are 104 items of 51,000 some odd selected road segments. Each road segment has its own line. And at this point, there are 104 selected in this small little area of, I believe it's Pierce County. Yes, because it is Pierce County Roads. So we have Pierce County Roads and a small selection highlighted. This is a view of an ARC Pro attribute table. I'll be doing a demo or you can do a self demo. Hover over the icons on your own. You can use Lab 1 or Lab 2 data if you've started Lab 2 to learn what each item in the top row means. So hover over each of these items on your own to figure out what each of them do. You'll be using them from lab two on through the rest of the time you take GIS courses. On the bottom, hover over the bottom row of the table and read the help about selected, move to end, number selected, filters, size, etc. So these will give you more insight to what you can do with the attribute table. I included this slide again, just as a reminder, I encourage you to read it again and prepare for your future upcoming opportunities. And please know that I'm always happy to write you a recommendation or serve as a reference for any jobs that you apply for moving forward. In class, we'll have some maps of the day, interesting maps presenters. Just a quick reference on this slide. This slide has appropriate amount of white space on the top and the bottom. Of course, there's too much on the left and a lot, far too much on the right. In this lower map, the white space around this map is bad on all four sides, north, south, east, and west. This slide details some additional Lab 2 technical information. When you ex export shapes and tables, you can obtain a shape or a table. If you're exporting from the catalog, you'll get a shape. If you export from a table, you'll get a table. That's something to remember. 
Be sure to know the difference between the catalog and Windows. Uh, this lab, lab two, you're zipping up your underscore project folder or BROJ rather than the underscore DIR folder. When opening a database file or .dbf or a text file such as a CSV with Excel, you're going to have to change the drop down in the bottom right of the open window from Excel files to exactly what you want to open or to show you all files and all files will give you any option that is available in Excel to open. You'll be using some Excel formulas in Lab 2. That's these, this X button and all formulas will start with an equals. On the right side of the screen, this is the insert function for a formula and you'll be using that in Lab 2. Be sure to paste values, not formulas, in Excel, and that is when you use the icon that looks like this, where it's one, two, three, and it's values. As mentioned earlier, just a reminder, you'll be using Windows, Excel, and Pro in Lab 2. In the lab, you'll be completing an attribute join versus a spatial join. Let me move this out of the way. And you can think of those two as one is the attribute join. You're using a unique key or unique field from each of the items, the shape and the attribute table. Whereas a spatial join, you'll be joining them spatially. And there's a significant difference. Uh, there is no unique key required when doing a spatial join. Each has their benefits and usually only one will work in your particular instance. It'll be hard to utilize the one that does not work. This slide gives you lab two in a nutshell. You're going to be visualizing gubernatorial and presidential voting climate or the gubernatorial and presidential voting climate in Washington for the 2008 and 2012 election. You'll do so via Windows creating some folders, downloading data from Firefox and Canvas, extracting data in Windows, exporting a DBF in Pro, in Excel, you'll be opening the DBF, removing duplicates, creating formulas, pasting special, and preparing a sheet. Excel has workbooks and sheets. There can be multiple sheets within a workbook, and you'll have multiple sheets within your one workbook. You'll go back to Pro and create a join using a unique key. Remember to start with the shape file. So that is you'll right click on the shape file. In Pro, you'll create a few more layers and then you'll symbolize eight complete layers detailing the Washington 2008, 2012 gubernatorial and presidential voting. This is just an interesting random 2016 election map. We didn't use 2016 data. Somebody sent this to me. This is purported to, to, dem to represent Facebook activity on the evening of the 2016 election. And I don't know how they derived this data, but I just thought it was interesting on to just show you a different type of election map. There's many things we can do with our data. At the end of lab two, your catalog will look very similar to this. You'll have at least one or two maps. You'll have your databases in two different places, within the database area and then within the folder connections. Remember that your folders, you'll have a directory folder and a project folder. 
we're zipping up the project folder in this lab and you'll also have your raw data. The lab one bonus will go over all of the bonuses that were submitted for lab one. Remember the rules. Uh, if you submit for a bonus, you allow for it to be discussed or viewed. We normally don't criticize. We only offer ideas for next time. So it's more of a think about this next time versus you should have because we're all learning at this stage and it's good to see visuals and enhance the future visuals that we create for our labs. Lab one was the easiest bonus of 311. I hope many of you submitted it and a lot of them I've seen already and they are exceptionally well done. For lab two, keep an eye on Canvas so you know what is due. Of course, you'll be working on your own, but I'm happy to answer questions. You have plenty of time to complete this lab. Technically due at 11.59, the day prior to your next class. You'll be submitting a write-up, a PDF, a zip, and the post quiz, and hopefully the bonus. For homework, if necessary, fin up your, finish up your Lab 2 deliverables. Complete the Lab 3 preparatory work and online quiz or quizzes. And then again, as a reminder, keep an eye on Canvas to be sure you know what is due. For example, I'll probably add in the learning plan so that you remember that as well. This slide is more for class. Before you leave, submit your deliverables and sign off and out of the computer. Restart the computer and then leave your taint card where it is or feel free to drop it off up front. Say goodbye. Um, I'm learning your names. So that helps me to do so. I'll be here in the classroom until 8.35 or when the last person leaves, whichever comes first. And last but not least, remember this is Easter candy to remind us not to leave the default pastel colored symbology, thus creating Easter maps. Nothing against Easter. Feel free to create Easter maps. That's awesome. I'd be delighted to see them if you do, but none of our maps are Easter maps. So please remove the pastel defaults of any submission that you upload. And that concludes day four lecture. I look forward to seeing you in class. Feel free to email me if you have questions about any of the assignments. I'm happy to help. Thank you very much.